I am absolutely delighted uh, to be joined by our guest today to discuss home language learning in international schools. And uh, Jacob will be will be guest hosting this event. So yeah, very exciting. Um, and yes, so just to sort of frame the discussion. So the importance, so what we'll be looking at is the importance of developing and maintaining students' home languages, um, also known as mother languages, first languages, um, as part of their international schooling is becoming more widely recognized. So as well as being fundamental to the academic learning of multilingual students and their well-being, the promotion of home language learning uh, also enriches our school's linguistic ecosystems and contributes to the development of international mindedness, global citizenship and intercultural understanding. In this panel discussion, we will explore these benefits, um, discuss the practicalities of how schools can design and implement home language programs, and consider how schools can create a shared understanding of the importance of home language development among all community members. So yeah, fantastic. Well, um, if we can just go through um, a few introductions. Uh, Carrie, you're at the top of my screen there. Do you want to do a quick, quick 10, 15 second introduction of yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Kaori from Japan. Uh, I teach Japanese as a mother language or first language, as well as uh, language acquisition in primary to um, through high school. Fantastic. Great to have you on. Um, Jacob, um, guest host as well. Do you want to just introduce yourself to John, hello. I'm I'm Jacob, and I'm an English language acquisition teacher at an international school in China. I'm also head of multilingual learning, and I'm also part-time doctoral researcher in um, multilingualism and interculturality in international schools. So, that's um, my interests. Brilliant, Martina. Hi, I'm Martina. I uh, research international mindedness in international schools, global citizenship education, and part of that is uh, multilingualism and uh, approach to English host and home languages in international schools. Thanks, Martina. Susan? Hi there. Uh, hello from London, where I'm currently based. Uh, I've worked in international schools in the UK, but also in uh, the Middle East and in uh, Thailand. Um, my uh, my most recent title was Head of Multilingualism, um, and I have a particular interest in family language policy. Brilliant. And last but not least, Ahmed. Hey, everyone. I'm Ahmed Gindi. I'm from Egypt. I'm working as an Arabic teacher, uh, as a first language or mother language, and also for the second language in uh, James International School, Dubai. Yep. Fantastic. Great to have everyone on this call. Um, right, I will hand over to Jacob um, to, to kickstart this discussion. Um, and yeah, hope you have all have a, have a fantastic chat. Over to you, Jacob. Okay, thank you. It's my great privilege to guest host this panel discussion about the topic of huge importance for all international schools. In our previous ISN panel discussion about multilingualism, we explored the necessity of linguistically inclusive and equitable approaches in our international schools. And part of this is the teaching of the languages of instruction, additional languages and home languages. And that phrase home language brings us to the tricky point of terminology. Home language, mother language, mother tongue, native language, first language, identity language, heritage language, and so on. These are the various terms that are used to describe what we're talking about today. And each of these terms has different emphases and connotations, and each is imperfect. A particular term seems to solve some of the shortcomings with other terms, but then causes problems of its own. This highlights the complexity of languages and the diverse ways in which our languages connect with our identities and the, the various roles they play in our lives. So as we discuss this topic, we may use different terms like home language or mother language, but as we use them, we acknowledge their imperfections and we use them cautiously, knowing that no term can perfectly capture the complex language realities of our students. But this much is clear. The maintenance or development of the languages of a student's family, communities and identities is a fundamental right. And it also has clear academic and well-being benefits, as we will discuss. And this is becoming increasingly recognised by international schools, teachers and curriculum organisations. But the question remains as to what practically we should do about it. 
what does good home language education look like in different international school contexts? How can we build systems and structures to promote it? What does it mean to teach it? What should schools do about it? And I'm looking forward to learning more about this from our panels as we explore both the why and the how of home language learning. So let's get started. Um, the first question I thought we would discuss is about the benefits of teaching and learning. So what what do you consider are some of the most important benefits of teaching and learning home languages in international schools? I'll jump in if you like. Um, uh, I think on a, on a practical level, many of our students, uh, if they are globally mobile, uh, might not know where they're going to be at the time when they approach uh, their studies. So on a on a purely practical level, you know, keeping all options open, making sure that our students have the possibility to study and work and socialize in as many languages as possible uh, makes sense. And I would even say we have a responsibility as a as an international school community to to do so. Um, but I also think you know on a on a more inclusive level, you know, just on an emotional level. Um, making sure that we welcome the whole student into our school, um, uh, you know, um, is the right thing to do and, and takes a lot of the, the current DEIJ um, focus that many schools are talking about. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else want to pick up on any of those or introduce some other benefits? Language is uh, one of the most, if not the most, uh, indicators of our students' identities. Our, our students are mobile students. As we said, they come uh, from different places. And it's important to fold uh, in two ways. Because first of all, uh, we allow our students to be who they are. So that does, that leads to their uh, positive self-identity. Uh, and the other thing, from the perspective of the school, it also helps the school to somehow counter the stigma the international schools have of, uh, you know, westernization or whether if international school is really uh, a Western school. Yes, so it is important to, as uh, Susan said, acknowledge our students for who they are and then allow them to develop uh, in that uh develop themselves within their identities to that extent, of course, they want to. Thank you. The the point of so you you just the point about westernization and it, it, are you talking about how the it, the linguistic diversity can give us another vision of what it means to be international? Is that is that what you're you're getting at there? Of course, because uh, international schools, uh, you know, operate predominantly in English. The teaching staff of international schools is predominantly English. Uh, studies show that parents predominantly send their children to international schools, native or non-native parents, for the children to learn English. So we can see that it's quite heavy on English. Yet if we call the school international, then we want uh, to include the diversity and uh, international schools should really encourage and uh, embrace all uh, children that are in the school, uh, no matter where they come from. Mm. So, mm. Again, so, okay. so their language is very important to, uh, you know, to 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 be cultivated. Mm. And can one way to challenge the dominance of of English within these international yeah. schools? Thank you. Kauri, did you want to come in with any other benefits? Yeah, I completely agree with what Martina said. So um, often from um, where I'm coming from, international, international education sometimes um, considered as a, a little bit more like assimilation to one particular culture or English speaking culture. But by having or providing mother tongue languages, um, so like school can show that they recognize the value of diversity uh, in languages and also what really international uh, education is, it, which is not only um, pushing English, but also embracing, like Martina said, other cultures and languages. Mm -hmm. and also, I, I really agree uh, what Susan said about 
um, so offering home language learning will help um, so a sort of emotional level for, for students. Um, it's kind of like, you know, repeating what uh, Martina said, though, um, home, lang home language learning will help them to develop their linguistic identity, which is help them to identify who they are and where they belong. And also like giving them the um, capacity of to understand what their culture is also giving their tool to express who they really are in their in their preferred language. Yeah, Ahmed? yeah great. Uh, I, I will say after this great uh, benefits, uh, I would say like the teaching and learning in the mother language in international school can be a benefit for the student in a many ways as uh, at the exit lane. Uh, also, I want to add like being being exposed to the other language culture from the very young ages. This it gives them or it gives a student the opportunity to learn as a second language or the third language or whatever it is as a native le level. Uh, the need for the communication also as well encourages students to learn from the other and teach them at the same time, which will help them to learn. Also, as they mentioned uh, about the culture, perceiving the culture also it being a benefit for teaching the language or the mother language in international schools, uh, increasing language skills like students who learn uh, a native, uh, learn their native language in international schools as a, as a second or first language, it develop or make it deeper understanding for the for the language achieve a higher level more than the people who uh, have it at home or learning at home. Thank you. If I could just jump in with what, one more uh, thought, listening to Kari and Ahmed, is is the need for international schools to consider how they're um, teaching host country language, both for the speakers of those languages, but also the, the students who might be there a few years, um, and how that language is viewed and how it's integrated into the curriculum. And is there anything to say here also about the kind of the academic benefits of the um, maintaining and developing home languages? Would anyone like to pick up yeah. on that? We've spoken about yeah. ident identity development. We spoke about internationalism mm -hmm. and cultural inclusion. How about the the academics of, of school life? Well, if I could jump in, like part of my study was, uh, part of my questionnaire was asking students, uh, it was over 200 students in international schools in Cyprus uh, about the knowledge of their native uh, language. So, but usually when we are talking about knowledge of native language, it's just assumed that students know the language because they speak a language. Well, I divided the question. So I asked them to self-assess them, so, uh, them in speaking, writing, and reading. Uh, so I asked students to self-report about their knowledge of their native language uh, in these three areas. And while vast majority, over 80%, did find themselves fluent uh, speakers of their native languages, these percentages were falling rapidly when it came to uh, reading and then writing. So just because we can see students speaking in their native language, it does not mean that these other components of language learning don't have to be developed. The other thing, then I start looking into the results further and I wanted to know what factors uh, influence uh, students, um, especially you know, those lower results uh, in writing and reading. And I took under consideration two factors, one being age and the other one, uh, the time they spent in international schools. And it became very clear that age really wasn't a uh, major contributing factor because what happened is no matter the age, the longer the students were in the international school, the lower they were self-reporting their, their, their reading and their writing skills in their native languages. So this is why teaching it uh, is, uh, is important because it's not only speaking what they pick up at home, there is there is so much more to language than just uh you know ver verbal communication. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think also when we when we welcome students' languages into a school, whether it be in formally in the curriculum, in the English speaking classroom, we're also then opening up all of their experiences, their literacy in the language, uh, all the skills that they can then transfer into their learning in English. Um, if they happen to be uh, from the host country, we're opening up um, you know, the possibility for students who are new to the country to, to better understand uh, where they're living. Um, and and we know uh, that you know the the stronger their understanding and their strongest language, the better their acquisition in other languages is going to take place. So it's a it's a win win. Yeah, the the literacy skills and the knowledge and the understandings are transferable across the mm -hmm. the languages within their repertoire. Okay, shall we move on to the practicalities then? Like we mentioned earlier about the how, though what. How, um, based on your own schools or the schools you're familiar with, how can we organize um, home language instruction, uh, mother lang language classes? How can we organize that in terms of systems and structures to ensure effective um, delivery of home language instruction? I think um, organizationally, um, what often happens in schools is that the different language departments function independently and they're not um, held together. I think every school, every international school needs an expert in multilingualism. Um, they need to be able to identify that. They can't assume that a language teacher is an expert in multilingualism. So having one expert that then can, can hold the different departments together um, make, make the curricula uh, talk to one another um, works really well. And it's been, uh, I know, um, uh, Jake, your title currently has the word multilingual in it. We're starting to see that more and more schools giving people that title. Um, I don't know whether anyone else here has someone on their staff with that title yet. I, I would just add to it that mm. part of it is that in looking at staffing of international schools uh, versus the student population, the idea, it, it seems like while students are very much multilingual, teachers and heads are monolingual. And I think there comes a little bit of a clash of misunderstanding it. So going in the direction uh, you and Jake are, uh, are presenting here, it's, it's a very good idea. Mm. Yeah, I do agree what Martina said. Um, so for example, um, in my school, or my um, teaching experience, so Japanese or any language, maybe Mohammed can speak about Arabic, but every language has different needs and characteristics. But um, if, we, if we taught uh, in one school, um, then, then we have a leadership team who's necessarily understand what Japanese characteristics, but still have to make decision for us. So for me, um, someone like Jacob, like who try to understand what are the needs of other languages or characteristics and um, kind of language learning timelines are very different. Uh, I don't want to go to details, but for example, Japanese um, will is categorized as one of the most difficult language for uh, English speakers. And it requires 2,200 2, 2, hours of uh, learning time to be fluent. But on, on the contrast, if you learn French, it's going to be 600 hours. So if you learn Japanese for two years, and if you learn French, the development will be very different. And then what we have to do day-to-day -day learning will look different. So um, I would appreciate, and it's important that school has someone who's tried to reach out and understand other language characteristic and make a decision for us. That's mm -hmm. it very important at the structure of school. Yes. So what we're talking about is the, the, the sorry, Ahmed, um, what we're talking about is the 
the leadership right of the the home language programs and it we can't just be down to the individual home language teachers it needs to be a whole school vision and a whole school approach that um that has that kind of leadership um Ahmed, would you like to talk a little bit about yeah. how it's in your school yeah i totally agree about her talking because uh a different language like english or japanese or whatever is like we, we face the same uh, challenge in, in our department and our schools as Arabic language, as we need to deal with uh, two type of learner who is uh, native and who is non-native. And, and if we talk about the native uh, in Dubai, we can say like they are not native schools or native native uh, student. Uh, the first language here in Dubai, it's be, we can say it's an English, you know? So for the Arabic speaker who is native, we deal with them like they are not even Arabic. You know, so we're trying to, and also we have that framework from which provide from the Ministry of Education and this stuff, we have to work on it and we have to 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 make it more real life or linked to life. So it being easy for the student to learn, not like, not only learning skills. I'm talking specific about the Arabic B who is not native. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, we have the, something we call the framework or KHDA uh, framework, which give us a lines and to work on it. But uh, as a teacher, we're trying to work to make this uh, kind of framework work with the student as a link to life, as a something it can uh, be in using every single day, yeah. every single time. So it'd be easy for them. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. And, and uh, so often, uh, like Kauri and Ahmed said, I think leadership isn't knowledgeable. Um, about languages or even the fact, for example, the, the, the great variety of Arabics you have and the fact that the Arabic studied in school is a formal level. Um, in, my, in my role as head of multilingualism, one of the biggest parts of my role was actually collaborating with the admissions department because I met every single new family. Um, now, I happen to speak a number of different languages and I happen to have lived in lots of places, so I had a, a good knowledge base but I learned from conversations with parents. I learned from conversations with colleagues about, um, you know, uh, the makeup of, of even um, students coming from Kazakhstan at the time, uh, the, 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 the Kazakh and Russian um, uh, sort of languages they already had in their repertoire. So the need to, to, to talk, I think, I think on one hand, it's, it's useful to have language departments, but actually, the way that I structured it in my school previously is all we had a department of literature languages. So, and then English was included in that. English was next to the other 23 languages. And then we had a department of language acquisition where English was also with the other language acquisition. So, because I think also, um, and that's a way of making sure that one language isn't more important than another um, and, and a way for teachers to learn from one another too. And that's, I think, what, so we're talking about the knowledge of the the leadership and skilling everyone up into building that shared understanding across the whole school community. And we'll come back, we'll come to that a little bit later. We talk about various stakeholders. Um, and just to go back to Ahmed's point about the having a framework. And I think you're like you were saying, the flexibility within that framework to allow us to meet the needs of students, because as we as I said earlier, when talking about the terminology, the realities of is so complex and students coming from different places and have different connections to the language. So although we need those structures and frameworks, it needs to be flexible enough for us to, to meet the needs of those students. I'm interested in one area we haven't really explored explicitly. We've spoken about learning um, when the host language may be the same as the the first language or the mother language or the home language of students. How um so and I think a lot of schools are starting to to do that and they are delivering those kind of um, language programs. But how about when we have a small number of speakers of a language or even just one or two um, students who speak the home language in a in a, a highly diverse kind of multilingual context? How can we um, help those students to maintain where we may not have the teaching staff within the school? We may not have the the access to the resources within the school for for so many languages. I, I, I think par working with parents would be a great resource here. Uh, first of all, um, what I've noticed in the schools that I've worked, um, 
there are certain national groups of parents, you know, that they, they tend to uh, keep together. And quite often they were coming to, to the school asking, well, can they use the facility for afternoon um, native language classes? Uh, and it's beneficial two ways. First of all, uh, you know, parents help uh, set up these classes. And second, secondly, the, the school is showing the parents the, 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 the respect they have uh, for their culture. So it's a win-win situation um, mm -hmm. where the school also is not being uh, left alone because quite often parents will better know uh, their native community in certain location. Maybe then also can uh, think of you know, online classes, uh, mm. find somebody uh, in the country of origin. So I think in that situation, parents really are the key. Yeah. yeah. I think also I've seen uh, very effective programs where you pair an older and a younger student. Um, and that's lovely to see if you happen to have an older student who's also new to learning in English and giving them a role of mentoring a younger student in the school. And, and all of a sudden they um uh they realize the the linguistic power they have in that relationship um I used to do a lot of work and I still do around um students uh, presenting their language portraits or their linguistic repertoires um because very often also we uh, many teachers are not aware of of what um the students speak at home or who they they use the language with um uh, and absolutely, like Martina said, or we assume that they have literacy in a language and they don't. So actually having having them just share with the class um, their full, you know, their full linguistic repertoire makes also students curious about one another. Sometimes all of a sudden they, without realizing, start comparing their languages, um, finding similarities, finding differences. Um, yeah, making space for it. So structurally, stru sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just the question of structures and and go back to that to to help people who may be watching and wondering. Well, how can I do this with, in our timetable? Where can we? How can we schedule these classes? Where can we put them? Um, does anyone have any advice or experience to share about that? Are the classes are all home language classes happening at the same time? Are students being removed from other subjects to access these courses? Does anyone want to share anything about that before we move on? Um, the the school that I was in was was highly um, dedicated to to supporting home languages. So we had um, twenty three languages happening um, all at the same time uh, over the week, about three and a half hours. Um, so and but it had to be to make it viable uh, because it was a relatively small school. The the classes were grouped vertically, so we had two or three grades together. Um, and at the, the same time, every day, everyone went into their language groups. That being said, there was a class for one reason or another where the students weren't doing their home language. And then that class became almost a linguistics class. So although we weren't teaching Albanian and Russian and um, uh, Sisetu, we were, um, that's where that class where the students spoke about their languages and we kind of uh, had them share their languages in different ways but it was, it was part of the curriculum. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share about that or should we move on to the next question? I can just add two things. The first, first thing that I've noticed was um, afternoon classes. Mm. And then the other thing that uh, we've seen are, uh, we, ha we, ha we have in Cyprus uh, many very small, but national schools like Saturday schools. Mm. Mm. So we had many students going for those, whether they were Russian, Bulgarian, Arabic, and so on, going to those, uh, to these Saturday schools. I had Russian students basically completing their A levels, finishing that, and then going to Russia to pass their uh, secondary uh, exams uh, in Russia in Russian. So having students doing that, uh, it, let let's face it, they are they are brilliant for doing that, but it it, it 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 must be very, very difficult. So I think the part of this is even if the school itself cannot provide students with their with native language classes, if they know of students uh, doing things like that, going to those 
additional national Saturday schools or trying to pass exams in their home countries, it's important that the school encourages it and is being more supportive in those situations. Yeah, I just want to add something for, as Suzanne and Martina said, that uh, uh, giving the time for the student or for who's new junior to the new joining to the school, like the Russian student, if we take an example, we have, if we go through the, the curriculum and some of them have been joining us in the middle of the term or something, we have department, it's called ELL, which we pull them outside of the class and start from the basics. So we give them time to to build their language step by step, not from the middle of the of the of the term or something. Also, if you talk about Arabic as a second language, as we have a student who join us later on, we design a, a curriculum which can support them inside and outside of the class. So we give them opportunity to learn the basics. Um, and of course, it, each teacher have a differentiation in the class, but sometimes being difficult for the student to to meet uh, the expectation if he's joining later on or if he's joining like grade three or grade four. So we give them like time to to learn about it or to start uh, with the department it's called ELL or uh, with the support outside of the class as well. Yeah, I, I think what many schools do is they set up a school, they have a vision for what they want to do, and they but they never analyze their school population. Or sometimes they set up a school and over time, the school population changes and they still stuck with the same curriculum options. Um, and uh, in general, schools are, are becoming on one hand more diverse and on the other hand, attracting more um, host country um, students who will be there for long term. So I think a big question for schools is, is your curriculum offering still um, fit for your student population? And, you know, um, and, and and in terms of priority, you know, what should we be prioritizing? And I think we all agree here, we should prioritize home language and the school language. And then initially, because that's what we know is going to help the student function in school and then look at other, and then probably host country language and then additional languages. And once that, yeah, once that priority is established, then as we can see, there are a number of ways that schools can find to, to yeah. deliver on, on that. Yeah. So let's think about how can we get the home language out of the home language classroom? So we've talked a lot about the setting the, the classes up and the structures and, and that, but how can we uh, make the home languages more visible in the life of the school and play a part in the wider life of the school outside of those classrooms? Kauri, would you like to start on that one? Sure. Um, I think one of the, the things we can do is make um, translanguaging as a school culture or um, the norm in like any subject mm -hmm. classroom so that students are like can use any language when they do research brainstorming or any you know activities can be bilingual multilingual I think it's important that any teacher encourage students to do it and then kind of treat that as a norm like let's use any language even though like, you know, the uh, medium of instruction is English, they probably have to produce uh, in English, but in the process, we should be encouraging the translanguaging. Yes, uh, for this point that, uh, as, as she mentioned, that's, uh, I wanna say that's a, a great idea or a great uh, part to work on, to make it visible around the schools or around outside of, uh, of the class. Okay, for that we're trying to make it like uh, to teach the language through the drama, as you know, the drama is making like the student do their best to uh, be in in a part or to be in uh, in the role play or whatever you present them. That give them motivity and give them the challenge to work hard. Uh, also to make it visible, uh, as as we celebrate the language day, um, mother language day, as we have in Arabic, the mother language day taking place at uh, 18 December, I believe, you know. Um, also the activity, it can be like uh, more drama, more uh, real life activity, uh, competition, which uh, will let the student uh, 
be part of it and encourage them to be part of it, a competition inside the school or with other schools which should be aware of it. Yeah. I um, I was lucky enough to take part in a research project uh, in the school where I was that taught 23 languages of the curriculum. So you think you, you, you've done it all, but this research project looked at the linguistic landscape of the school, or they call it schoolscape in research. So basically, what, what, what languages do you see in the school? And the researchers first came in and walked around the school and took lots of photos, and you could see languages here and there. Um, but then what was fun was the students became co-researchers and we gave primary school students a map of the school and we said to them, label where you use your languages in school. Now, if you walked around that school, you would hear the languages all over the place. The, the majority of students looked on the map for the classroom where they had their home language and labeled that Arabic and then wrote English, English, English everywhere else. Now, that's not the reality. They use their language in class. They use their language in the playground. But when we saw that, we realized the children thought that that was what they should be doing. And that made us realize we needed to be ex more explicit in, say in, in saying to the students, use your language. We want you to use your language. Um, and the, the power of seeing it, um, uh, you know, is, is part of that. Um, we also, uh, we gave them an iPad then and said to them, walk around the school and take pictures of where you see language. And again, they all ran to their language classroom and took pictures there. Um, so that that really made us rethink how we were presenting languages around the school. Um, so we then gave the children the opportunity to display something in any language anywhere in the school. And that was where it was powerful to see the students were advocating for each other. Oh, Ahmed. I didn't see any Arabic. Let's make an Arabic sign together. Um, and they were they were looking after one another. Uh, wonderful exercise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's a great thing. That I, I have been done this activity with this with a student. I was teaching how to write the sign in the Arabic. So mm -hmm. I was asking them, okay, let's uh, write the sign around the school. So we will design it and we'll make it uh, work and we will put it different way. Like don't try and like hey. Uh, stop here and this stuff. Um, as you mentioned, also the, the signs that we used to write, like if he, my name is Ahmed Al-Jindi in Arabic, in English, we used to write the Arabic down. So if we do have activities, so we ask a student, okay, we're learning about for the K, for the KG2 or uh, grade one. Okay, we did, we're learning about the Arabic letter, let's say letter me or whatever it is. So go around the school, go outside of the class and look which word you can find the same letter that we learned. Uh, the label, as you said, is the cafeteria, how to say it, how to write it in Arabic in the same place, the library, whatever it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that schoolscape project that you're talking about is something that we could all do in our schools Absolutely. as a way of gathering that, like we said about, do we really know the reality of our schools, what languages are being used, how they're being used? That would be a, a really interesting way of exploring yeah. that with, within our teams. Um, yeah, a funny little anecdote too. Uh, you know, even if you do then try and sort of, I later did projects with other students where we did multilingual signage around the school, but I, I, these were middle school students. And I said to them, do not use Google Translate. Make sure that you check it with a speaker of the language. But they went ahead and put all these signs up. It was wonderful. It was a sort of COVID sign, multilingual COVID signage project. And they put a sign up in the, in the, in the hallway in, in Japanese. We have a, had a large Japanese community in school and about a week later I noticed a little piece of paper stuck over the sign where they'd gone and corrected it because of course my students had Google translated <laughs> and somebody in the community luckily had very quietly just gone and corrected it. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Uh, just mm -hmm. shows how the community can pull together and work yeah. collaboratively through these kind of projects. Mm -hmm. Martina, would you like to share anything on, on this one before we move on? Just uh, just thinking about what Susan said, why other students thought that, well, they should put English in all other uh, all other classes. I think it's 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 also a balance because if we know that 
predominantly uh, parents want to send their children to learn the English language and then get international qualifications. Uh, you know, so, so this also may influence uh, how students uh, how students think. Uh, if all other classes take place in English, uh, and, 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 and you know, it's a difficult balance because from one hand, yes, you want students uh, to, and I think especially for, for school leaders, uh, because from one hand, yes, we want to have this very much intercultural community that uh, thrives of, uh, you know, its diversity. From the other hand, I believe that school leaders have, uh, you know, very clear uh, objective in their mind. They know why parents are sending their children mm -hmm. uh, to their school. So also they have to, uh, you know, make sure that the English language is being spoken and it's being spoken at a, at a level that allows the, the students to pass the exams at, at, at the highest level because, you know, that's the goal. So I think there also there is some kind of uh, uh, it 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 is that there has to be a balance between the two, understanding it from the perspective of interculturalism and diversity, and also uh, from the perspective of school leadership and um, you know just this more globalist uh. Mm -hmm purpose of international schools which make them such successful businesses uh so so this is also worth discussing by by the leadership and with the leadership where is this golden uh golden the golden middle that makes everything work together and that that brings us nicely to the next question about the the resistance that we may face from from parents or or other students or from the leadership or other teachers when we're implementing home language classes or or home language learning in our schools, how can we address some of those concerns that may be raised? How can we um, tackle some of those misconceptions and resistance from those different stakeholder groups? Yeah, I'll, I'll... go ahead, Ahmed. Go, go ahead, Suzanne, after you. <laughs> um, I'll repeat what I said earlier. Every school needs a language expert, a multilingualism expert, and you need a written language policy. Um, and, and that expert is the gatekeeper of that policy. Um, so many schools are misaligned. Uh, and what Martina was saying about, uh, you, you know, what, what are international schools selling to parents? And if, if we're selling English, uh, but our language policy says something different, then that means the admissions or the marketing department actually isn't aligned with the values of the schools. So, so getting something in writing, um, so important. Uh, having that expert on the, on the interview panel of every teacher, making sure that every teacher that starts working in that school is aligned with the language policy. Sorry, Ahmed, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I want to share about that, about the misconception that we have, because uh, as I'm talking, I'm talking about the language, as the Arabic language I'm teaching. We we have a challenge or misconception uh, as the Arabic A or who's native and who's not native. For the native speaker, they feel like the language is not used and we have, we've been here in international culture or international uh uh, school so we are using English and English which is enough and this so we used to talk to them like yep even if we have an international uh, Cali international community or something we still need the Arabic mm, as as we have many Arabic country maybe we go in uh, go to so we, we need to use this language as well um, also we're trying to challenge them like yes it's still will take us to the first questions that we have about the benefits of teaching the mother language yes still that's our language and we need to learn and we need to uh, keep it and save it uh, for for our uh, uh, kids or something uh, even if in Dubai it's not uh, there is a lot of places also still speaking in Arabic not only uh, English you can see that Dubai yes Dubai is fully English but if you go to Georgia or Sharjah or Iraq or whatever it is, you'll find only the language you choose. Uh, it's only Arabic. So how we are we guaranteed that we're gonna stay in the place or area which speak in English only? Maybe we'll go home back. So we need the English. So this misconception and also the misconception uh, which which we have with 
non-native speakers like the the field that challenge for them like yeah we're going to learn a new language with a new alphabet with a new way of writing way of speaking not like a spanish you so you learning english is still the same uh, alphabet or something so we used to have a morning coffee with them in the morning to talk about uh how we can support them, how we can share with them some evidence, some, I mean, resources that it can help at home. We're not expecting you to help at home, but we need your support to give him the, the environment just to work on it, on and this stuff. Yeah, yeah Ahmed, do you think that those misconceptions or attitudes towards Arabic come from the home? Sorry? Do, do you think that the attitudes that the students have towards Arabic maybe comes from the home or from their parents? Actually, I want to say yes, but also I want to say that the student, let's say his, he has an Arabic like one hour, okay? Mm -hmm. After was this one hour, he never practiced the language anymore as, a, as Arabic language. Mm -hmm. he's, he's going to the playground, he's speaking English, uh, home room, he's speaking English. At home, even his family is Arab, he's still speaking English, you know? Yes. So it's been like he's not using it, so... What's the point of learning it if I'm not using it? I'm, I'm using only with, with you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's important for us to be on the same page as parents because I think what they what they value is um greatly influence what students values. Mm -hmm. And so in my experience, like talking with Japanese parents who send the kids um to our school and hoping then he will or oh, their child pick up english and then it, that will open up you know future career opportunities mm -hmm. so they tend to not value um learning home language then if i said oh that's going to be important blah 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 it's harder for them to hear what i said or it's harder for them to see uh, with the lens that teachers see. Mm. Um, so as a, in my previous school, I was working as a, a parent liaison. And what I found very beneficial is connecting parents, uh, having a parent's community talk mm. about how they get, you know, integrating English culture, how they transform when they starting mm. learning English so that they can see the benefit, but also they see that they start losing the ability of communicating in Japanese or um, acting not like Japanese. Of course, they will learn, they will act like a bit more English speaker. Mm -hmm. Then when they turn like 18 or when they're graduating, like how like being a bilingual um means to family like a family relationship so yeah. that those experience will kind of open up parents um, eyes for someone like you know parents of grade one and two who's believing oh it's going to be okay my kids will speak Japanese no problem but what really like going through it's got more complex then yeah. then they start realizing the value of having the or sharing the language that they can fully understand each other and fully be able to express each other, then then they will start a bit more, you know, on our side or on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. What you said, go ahead in. Sorry, Ahmed. This part of Martiana go about it. It's, uh, it's uh, the language is not only speaking it. Yeah, speaking it, you, you can learn it at home. Uh, it's still we, we're missing the skills like writing the the difficult skills that we we face in in teaching language so it's not only about uh, speaking as you mentioned like i'm gonna my kids are gonna learn uh, japanese or whatever is no they need to be taken serious so the yes we will give them opportunity at the school even we have to involve the the community with your family at house at home which will help us to to make more progress with these kids as, as across the whole uh, skills, not only speaking or or whatever it is, it should be across the school, across the skills as well. Yeah. But it's interesting how different parents uh, treat it, isn't it? Some want their children to know as many languages as possible because they see it as benefit. Uh, 
others don't. Uh, so, so it's quite interesting. Uh, I have a very uh, multilingual and multicultural family, and the three-year-old who is now being pushed three languages at once at him, uh, which I just, you know, like, my idea is fingers crossed. Uh, I'm reading some research about it, but, well, we, wait is the answer usually. But... Uh, but yes, but uh, I, I know of other families uh, being multicultural, uh, yet, you know, they choose to stick to one language, which is, for example, the family, family language being English, despite the fact that none of the parents is a native English speaker. So mm -hmm. it's quite interesting. It's very individual decision also. Yeah. yeah. But, but I, I do think coming back to uh, what I mentioned earlier, as, a, as schools, we should, from the moment um, a teacher applies to work in our school, from the moment a family visits our school, we need to make sure they understand what the school's priorities are and so and, and so that they know what they're, they're buying into um, so that they don't get in there and then you have those discussions that are a little bit difficult. Sometimes parents, um, uh, the misconceptions are just because they, they still have this view that that languages are in competition with one another rather than working together. So it's often just about um, running a, a calorie, what you did of having parent meetings, you know, wonderful, because that's where you can shift parents' understanding of what is it to be bilingual and biliterate. And once they have that understanding, then, then your discussions kind of might sort themselves out. I think the way... Kauri said it best earlier when she said get everyone on the same page and trying yeah. to get the whole community on the same page and understanding this vision and understanding that it's not a question of either or it's about both and and we can we can develop students English and the language of instruction mm -hmm. and we can also develop the home languages and include those in our international schools mm -hmm. as well so we're almost at the end of our time but I thought maybe just for the last minute or so would would go around and share any final thoughts, um, any kind of last things you'd like to say to to leave with the people who are watching this to to um, any kind of final reflections. I think a word I've not used yet this morning um, is bi-directional. So again, thinking of those languages and, and for us to keep on remembering that 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 transfer between languages, whether it be literacy, understanding of literacy, um, understanding of concepts, it goes both directions. Uh, and if we can harness that in our curriculum, in our in the way we've structured uh, uh, staffing, in the way we talk with parents, uh, it's a good start. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Kauri? Um, yeah, like what uh, Susan said, we tried to set up some spiral learning model, like, you know, using two languages in my school, Japanese and English. And then we recognize language learning is a transferable mm -hmm. and to have the teaching the same concept, but in different languages so that kids can develop both languages. I think that's a great model. Thank you. Ahmed, would you like to share any final thoughts? Um, not really. But, uh, as, as Suzanne said and Martiana, that we have to deal with uh, parents and we have to show how, how, how like, uh, when we, we come to our school, we have to make sure what the priority for our school and how the challenge we have. So we make agreement with them, like, yeah, that's what we're offering you, that's what we uh, expected you to support us and thank you martina yes i would i would say based on what what everybody was saying and i found very important what susan said uh there is no one size fits all international schools are very individual and even one school can change over time so i think that the start is understand your population Mm -hmm. understand your student population, understand your teacher population, understand your parent population, mm -hmm. see where they are coming from, develop a policy uh, based on that. And 
stick to it, but if it needs revising, revise it because you know things are very dynamic. But it's important that we do everything that we allow our students in an international community to develop positive self-identity uh, and allow for this diversity. Uh, you know, there may be, there may be, as, as we spoke before, there may be parents who who do not want that, but it does not mean that this choice should be taken away. So once we once we make this a priority, then we can find the ways that work within our own context and that make sense for our own school communities. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much. It's been great to to speak to you all and to learn from you all and to um, just reaffirm the importance and start to think through some of these these questions about how we can how we can make this kind of um, this vision a reality in our international schools. So thank you very much, um, everyone, for participating and for sharing your ideas and experience. And I'd like to hand back over to Max. Fantastic. I'd just quickly like to reiterate that, Jay, give me a fantastic job. And thank you, everyone, so much for joining. Some really, really interesting insights there. And I really like the practical side of things as well, you know, to give give listeners and viewers of this some some real ideas to, to take away and think about implementing in their own in their own school environments. So, yeah, thank you once again. And uh, yeah, maybe look forward to doing a part two sometime soon.